So good morning and uh, this is week 3 of uh, CS103. Today we will be doing uh, transposes and determinants okay, and their properties and we will look at uh, the general formula to compute the determinants and somewhere along the way we will look at uh, matrices with special properties, special kind of elements or special shape or something and we will look at the names of those matrices mainly because if you do any kind of uh, web research you will find those names and uh, if you don't know the names then you will be at a loss to understand what it is that those guys are talking about. Since we are limiting ourselves to the real matrices, matrices over the field of uh, real numbers, there is one set of names and if you extend it to complex numbers there are different names unfortunately and to make matters even worse real numbers are special cases of complex numbers so whatever name you have in the complex field can be used for real numbers also so there may still be unfamiliar names cropping up once in a while we will try to mop it up towards the end of the course so that uh, there's no confusion okay let's start with the uh, uh, transpose though transpose is a fairly easy concept what you're doing is just swapping rows and uh, columns so if you have a matrix if you have a matrix of uh, uh, m rows and n columns if you transpose it if you swap the rows and columns then you have n rows and m columns because whatever columns you had in a will become uh, rows in uh, in uh, a transpose and uh, whatever rows you had in a will become columns in uh, a transpose so the numbers will just swap if you want to talk in terms of the elements of the matrix the element of a that was in the ith row jth column will become an element of a transpose in the jth row ith column saying all these things in words it's fairly easy to see what it means but it's kind of a bit harder to put it down as a definition mathematically so we'll try to do that uh, standing on the shoulder of a couple of other definitions so let's start with an example though i have a three by four matrix so three rows and four columns I take the transpose then i'll have four rows and three columns three rows and four columns which are color coded and each column each column will become a row there so the red one became a red row there so that's all it's a very very easy concept now there's a special case if you have a column vector which is a single column matrix and if you take the transpose it becomes a single row matrix because the columns become uh, rows right so if you take x that is a member of uh, rn x transpose becomes a member of r1 by n one row and n uh, columns so that is a row matrix some people might call that uh, a row vector so here's a column vector three numbers standing on top of each other and you ask them to lie down you get the transpose we did use this uh, in the definition of dot product where we said x dot y is x transpose times y or y transpose times x now that we know what it is let's try to define it so the main diagonal of a matrix are the elements that i have highlighted there what's special about these elements the first one is in the position 1 1 the second one is in 2 2 third one is in a 3 3 a third row third column and in general it will be in position i i so the collection of elements that are uh, in the ith row and ith column position that is the main diagonal the main diagonal doesn't go to the bottom right corner but it does start at the top left corner it always starts at 1 1 first row first column and then it keeps going down and to the right to the extent possible it might go and hit the bottom the floor or it might go and hit the bracket the right wall if it does then uh, you stop at that point that is the main diagonal so it is defined for all matrices not just uh, square matrices a transpose also has the same uh, main diagonal what we do in taking the transpose is to look at the main diagonal here and kind of take the reflection swapping uh, each element about the main diagonal so we'll flip it around you take 5 and put it in the position of 1 and take 1 and put it in the position of 5 get reflected by the mirror imaginary mirror that is on the main diagonal now i have a notation whereby i write i will write in my book and uh, in the in this course something like a is uh, equal to square bracket a i j by which i don't mean a is a one by one matrix i mean a is still an m by n matrix and this a i j is a representative typical element of that matrix so that's my notation because of the potential confusion with uh, this being a one by one matrix this notation is probably not ideal but i used it uh, throughout my book i don't even know if it is actually a general notation that other people use since i used it in the book i'm going to stick to it but from the context you are expected to infer that uh, this is actually an m by n matrix in most cases i will write it this way 
say the whole thing there. So if that, if you allow me to use that notation, then A transpose is just the same kind of notation, but with the column index and row index swapped. And then it becomes an N by M matrix. N uh, rows and M columns as opposed to M rows and N columns. So we define the main diagonal. It's a collection of elements of the type A, I, I. So start from the top left and then go down and to the right to the extent possible. Then we introduce this new notation there. So transpose of a matrix using the concept of main diagonal is a, is a reflection or a, or a flipping of uh, the elements about the, the main diagonal. So let's look at some of the properties of uh, transposes. So we take a transpose and transpose it again. So A transpose transpose is A because you're just flipping it once and then flipping it again. So you get the original one back. And again, by looking at the definition, you can see that the transpose of a sum of two matrices is the sum of the transposes of the matrices. Then the operation of scalar multiplication and the operation of transposition or taking the transpose can be commuted. So you can multiply first and then take the transpose or transpose first and then take the, the scalar multiplication. So here I'm scaling first and then taking the transpose or the transposition happens first and after that I'm scaling. And the next one is a, a conceptually important point, a scalar. A scalar is its own transpose because we think of a scalar as a one by one matrix as I have written down here. Scalar is its own matrix. It's a, scalar is a very special entity. Scalar is a member of R. It's a member of R1 if you think of R as a, a vector, a set of vectors or a vector space. Okay. Or if you think of uh, R as a matrix space of one row and one column, S is a member of that also, a special mathematical entity. So. If you think of uh, S as a one by one matrix, then if you take the transpose, the main diagonal is that element, the matrix S transpose, which is the same as matrix S, so which is by definition is the same as a scalar. So scalar is its own transpose. So if you have a one by one matrix, or one of the properties of the scalar is the fact that it's its own transpose. So we can, maybe we can actually use it in some of the proofs, which we will actually do today. Now, there is an important uh, rule uh, product rule of transpose. So which says A B transpose, the transpose of a product is B transpose A transpose. It is the transpose of the, the matrices multiplied, but in the opposite order, the reverse order. That is critical. And this is used in uh, many, many places. It's a basic property. Uh, let me give you an example of it. So I take uh, two matrices here. A is a two by three matrix, two by three. So it's got three columns and B is a three by two matrix. So it's got three rows. So the number of columns of A is the same as the number of rows of B. So you can multiply them. And what will you get? You'll get a two by two matrix. So AB is that once you have AB, you can take the transpose. All you have to do is to swap these two guys, which is what I have done there. Okay. Now I can actually take B transpose coming from here. So three, four in a row becomes three, four in a column and so on. Same thing with A. I can take the transpose of that. Now B transpose has uh, three rows and uh, three columns and uh, two rows. And A transpose got three rows and two columns, so it, they can be multiplied. They're conformant for multiplication. So if, I'm, if I multiply, if I actually sit down and do this by hand, you will get uh, that answer, which is the same as uh, A, B, the whole thing transpose. There is a proof. We can prove this product rule. I will kind of flash the proof to you and I'll refer you to the textbook book to go and look at it. But before looking at the proof, let's look at uh, the conformance requirement for multiplication to see that uh, the product rule at least is conformant in terms of multiplication. Okay, this is the product rule. If you can multiply, if AB is defined at all, then AB will have to be in the form where A has uh, K columns and B has K rows. So that uh, this K and that K can kind of cancel and you will get AB as, a, uh, as an M by N matrix, as a member of the matrix space R M by N. Now, if AB is a member of uh, R M by N, or if AB has M rows and N columns, then AB transpose will have N rows and M columns. So keep that in mind. Now, if I take B transpose, B is this, B is this, that's the shape of B. So transpose will have the columns and rows are inverted. So it'll have this shape. Similarly, A transpose will have that shape. Again, K comes in between them and that will get canceled. And if you multiply, what you will get is a matrix of size N rows and m columns so that is the same as that so at least in terms of the conformance of uh, matrix multiplication the rule seems like it is consistent at least i'll show you two proofs i'll kind of flash it i don't want to spend time on it because uh, basically the proof 
uses the definition of uh, uh, matrix transpose and the matrix multiplication in a fairly straightforward way, but it's tedious. It's tedious to actually describe it. So I've done it using words here in this slide and even more words in the textbook. So take a look at it and it should be obvious. Here I'm looking at matrix multiplication in terms of uh, the dot product of the row, the rows of the first matrix and the columns of the second matrix. The, the proof is uh, tedious but straightforward. And if I want to use the element wise uh, definition of uh, matrix multiplication, that also can be done and uh, which is even more tedious because there's more things to write down, but it also works. But I would recommend, I would refer you to the textbook to actually read and understand the proof. A dot B is uh, a scalar. So we defined A dot B or we kind of showed you last week that A dot B is actually A transpose B. That's a scalar. S is a one by one matrix. So if this is true, then the transpose, if you take transpose on both sides, that should be equal to. So if I take A transpose B, the whole thing transpose, will have to be the matrix S transpose, which we know is just S because there's only one element in it. In it. If you flip it till you're blue in the face, it's not going to go anywhere. So this is the same as S. So the transpose of a scalar is itself. Now on the left hand side, we can apply the, the product rule of transposes, which means it's going to become B transpose. That is a second matrix times A transpose, the whole thing transposed again. That is B transpose A. Okay, so you can see that A transpose B is the same as B transpose A, where A and B are of column vectors. True only if A and B are column vectors, which is another way of saying A dot B is the same as B dot A. Okay, so that's the proof. Let's look at some uh, matrices with special properties, either in the shape or the, the nature of the elements or something. Okay, so the first one is a square matrix. When the number of rows of the matrix is the same as the number of columns, then it's a square matrix. I will write R n by n. You see those two things are the same. That means it's a square matrix. So that's the way you will see it. So R 3 by 3 is a collection of uh, all square matrices of three columns and uh, three rows. Now there is an interesting fact that for any matrix A, M, N, M and N are general numbers, so they don't have to be the same. For any such matrix, a, A transpose is a, uh, a member of R M by M and A transpose A is a member of R N by N. Those, both those guys are uh, square. So I have, I said uh, A is a member of R M by N. So A transpose is going to be a member of what? So I can multiply A and A transpose. These guys, these guys are the same. So if I take A, A transpose, that is going to be a member of R M by N. And if I take uh, the multiplication the other way, then you will see that these guys are the same. So if I take A transpose A, that will be a member of R N by N. So they are both square matrices. What I showed you on my whiteboard is that uh, A transpose can always multiply A either on the right or on the left because the A transpose and A are always conformant for multiplication on either side, which is a uh, just a consequence of the fact that uh, what is the transpose of the other, the rows and columns all line up properly. Okay, now let's look at uh, uh, another definition. If a matrix is symmetric, then what it means is that its transpose is the same as uh, itself. So that basically says that A is equal to A transpose. That is the definition of symmetric matrix. Okay, that basically you're looking at the symmetry about the, the main diagonal. So let me ask you, is it possible for a matrix to be symmetric? and not square at the same time. It's not because if you take the transpose of a rectangular non-square matrix, the shape is already different. So there's no way those two matrices can be the same. They are not even in the same uh, matrix space. They are in different uh, universes. They can never be equal. So all symmetric matrices are square matrices. Then similarly, there is a skew symmetric matrix. matrix. It's also called anti-symmetric matrix. When the transpose is uh, the negative of uh, the original one. Again, this applies only for square matrices. There's an important property implied in the definition of a skew symmetric matrix. Let me make it a little simpler. Can you say anything about the elements along the main diagonal? Do they have any special property? They have to be zeros because they are expected to be the negative of itself. The only number, only real number that is the negative of itself is zero. Minus one times zero is uh, zero. So minus zero is the same as zero. Okay, so the diagonal, the main, the elements along the main diagonal are going to be zero in a skew symmetric matrix. Now, if you want to construct a, a symmetric matrix, one easy way is uh, add A and to its own transpose, then you will get a, 
a symmetric matrix. Of course, in order to be able to add A to A transpose, A will have to be a square matrix so that when you take the, the transpose, it has the same shape. And A minus A transpose is anti-symmetric. By the definition of, uh, of uh, the symmetric and, uh, and asymmetric matrices and uh, yeah, and one of the properties of transposition, you can prove these things. Let's see. So let me take A minus A transpose. I want to know what its transpose is. I just take a transpose of that. We know that uh, transpose of a sum is a sum of transposes. So this becomes A transpose minus A transpose transpose, which is A, which is uh, negative of uh, A minus A transpose. So this basically says that uh, the whole thing here is a uh, skew symmetric. Now, we talked about A transpose A and A A transpose. Are they symmetric matrices? It turns out they are. So if I take A transpose A and transpose it, what happens? I'll get, I'll take the second one, transpose it, and that becomes the first one. And take the first one, transpose it, and that becomes the second one of the product. And that is A transpose transpose. So that becomes A transpose A, which is the same as what I started from. So A transpose A is a symmetric. So earlier we saw that it was a square matrix, but it's better than that. It's actually a symmetric matrix. By the same argument, you can see that A A transpose also is symmetric. Now, A transpose A is called the Gram matrix. This guy Gram is a did a lot of stuff uh, with matrices and linear algebra. So you will see his name repeated here and there. In neural networks, uh, I have seen this. Uh, they said it's used uh, for what they call style mapping, if I remember right, in neural networks. Unfortunately, I don't know anything more about neural networks and the concept of style ma mapping. Just keep it in mind that uh, gram matrices are used in uh, machine learning algorithms such as neural networks. But something that I do know is the covariance matrix. If you have a data matrix, which we call A, and if I take A transpose A, that is like the covariance matrix. If you actually take out the mean from all the, the elements, a member of R, M, N, where M is greater than N, that means A has a shape, is a tall matrix, a few columns, and uh, many more rows. So that's the shape. Okay. So that is typical of our data matrices in our data science or in our computer science because you have a certain variables along which you are making the measurement and you have multiple measurements, many more measurements than uh, variables. That's typical. If you take A transpose, that is a, a wide matrix. And if you take A transpose A, then that becomes a square matrix, but a smaller one. A A transpose is a huge matrix, very difficult one to deal with, but A transpose A is a smaller matrix. Now, on top of that, if you average each column and subtract that average entity from each element, what you're basically doing is taking out the mean of the data in each variable so that if you plot uh, each one of the variables, it becomes zero center. You're just taking out the mean and moving the mean to zero. In the zero centered data set, A transpose A is a covariance matrix, which you can see if you, if you remember your statistics and uh, remember the formula for covariance and look at uh, what happens if you take out the mean and take A transpose A, each element will become uh, the covariance of the corresponding uh, variables. So this will have n variables here, n variables there. So each element will become the covariance and the diagonal will become uh, the variance. So you can easily see that. That is from statistics and uh, that is another application. Not application, it's a feature of the gram, the gram matrix. It's interesting because a statistical quantity, which is a bit tedious to compute if you were to do this uh, by hand or in a computer program, becomes basically a matrix multiplication. All right, let's define one more term one more name called the diagonal matrix. We already defined what a main diagonal is. If in a matrix, anything other than the main diagonal is zero, all elements other than the main diagonal are zero, then we call that matrix a diagonal matrix. So we are saying that anything other than the main diagonal is zero, but we are not specifying what the main diagonal elements have to be. They may or may not be zero. So if everything else is a zero, then it's already a diagonal matrix. Usually when we talk about diagonal matrices, we are talking about uh, square matrices typically so that the diagonal runs from the top left to the bottom right corner but it's not necessary without any ambiguity we can define diagonal matrix for any shape so this is kind of like the mathematical definition for a in my notation with a typical element aij a member of uh, matrices with m rows and n columns it is diagonal if the non-diagonal elements a i j when i is not equal to j those are the non-diagonal elements are all zero but we are not saying anything about the diagonal elements they they may also be zero but so in other words a matrix with all zeros is, is a diagonal matrix too 
see that a lot of the properties that we are a lot of the names that we are defining here can be applied to the zero matrix zero matrix what's the role of zero matrix if you compare it to normal numbers real numbers what's the equivalent of uh, the zero matrix in real numbers it is like zero in uh, in r the zero number when you add it to any other number you get the the original number back and it does nothing it's called the the additive uh, identity or the identity of addition similarly a zero matrix in the space of matrices is uh, the identity of addition addition being the basic operation that we define for matrices and a zero vector which is uh, a zero matrix with one column of course is the identity of uh, addition for the vectors of the same size okay that but zero matrix uh, can also be thought of as a diagonal matrix. Now let's define another important matrix called the identity matrix. It's a square matrix with once along the diagonal. It's a square matrix. It's a diagonal matrix. It's only once uh, along the diagonal and zero everywhere else. And this we use the symbol I for identity or I n if you're talking about uh, specifically about uh, the number of rows and number of columns n. So for a uh, square matrix with n rows and n columns, if the diagonal elements are 1 and non-diagonal elements are 0 when i is not equal to j then that matrix is an identity matrix in n dimensions now you can see that if you multiply a by identity matrix or either on the left or right then it is a it does doesn't do anything to the to any matrix so that is an alternative definition of identity matrix but there's only one kind of identity matrix and it'll turn out to be this the only matrix that can do this is the identity matrix so what's the role of uh, identity matrix uh, what's the equivalent of identity matrix uh, for numbers it's one it's like one i identity matrix is a square matrix it's a symmetric ma matrix it's also a diagonal matrix let's look at uh, uh, the identity matrix a little more closely because it's an important matrix it's a very important matrix just like one is a very important number in the world of real numbers the identity matrix is a very important matrix one thing we can say is that the columns of the identity matrix the column vectors that are si standing side by side in an identity matrix are in fact unit vectors we call them we will call them unit vectors and i'll tell you what it means in a second so they actually specify something like directions in space now here i have to be a bit careful directions of vectors are actually a concept more appropriate to physics than uh, computer science the space in which vectors have directions is called the the coordinate space you have x-axis y-axis and z-axis and you have a vector somewhere in in there and that has a direction and if the direction happens to be along the x-axis and if the length happens to be one we will call that uh, the first unit vector the unit vector along the first direction similarly y and uh, z so that's the kind of vectors that you have in uh, uh, an identity matrix now that viewpoint is not uh, uh, nascent not not uh, inherent to linear algebra because linear algebra even though we are looking at vectors as column vectors they don't really have to be uh, anything like that at all in computer science we are looking at them as a column vectors a column of numbers and then we can think about the first element as in a coordinate space the x direction or uh, along the x direction or something like that but in general in linear algebra without any representation like that vectors do not have an existence outside uh, the abstract concepts of uh, uh, vector addition and the scalar multiplication so what i mean by that is this if you take if you look at uh, the definition of vectors vectors are those objects those mathematical entities that obey scalar multiplication and vector addition so let me give you another set of uh, objects which we will actually look at uh, later on to show how it is used but let me give you one example i have some functions could be any function of any variable let's say it's a function of just one variable and i'm looking at this function in the region that that variable running from zero to one so that's the region and it's got some shape okay that is one function and i have another one with the, some other shape a different function if i add these two functions f1 plus f2 i'll get another function some other function maybe f3 if i scale one function if i scale the first one by something i'll get some other function let's say f4 so if i take functions defined between 0 and 1 as a vector it basically obeys the closure property of scaling and uh, the closure property of addition so i can actually deal with uh, functions as though they are vectors and if i want i can define a dot product between uh, two vectors which are just functions this time as something like an integral running from 0 to 1 f1 f2 
let's say it's uh, actually the, the variable, the dummy variable is uh, x, so it's some integral like that. If I define it like that, then I have defined uh, the dot product also. Then this is actually a complete set of uh, vectors, and it's just that each vector here, how many points do you have between 0 and 1? You have infinite number of points. So it's like an infinite dimensional function. So this way of looking at uh, functions, uh, uh, this way of uh, dealing with uh, vectors in some abstract sense, is actually used in uh, in uh, uh, in physics in quantum mechanics linear algebra is used and the the vectors there are not vectors that stand in a column and in this case you don't really have you cannot talk about directions here anymore because uh, for one thing you have uh, infinitely many of them secondly it doesn't really make sense to talk about the direction of a function and this is for this reason that uh, if you're dealing with linear algebra in an, in an abstract theory theoretical or mathematical sense probably not appropriate to talk about directions. Directions will happen only if you have a finite number of uh, elements and uh, especially like two or three and then you're thinking about some space in which these uh, vectors exist etc. But it can be used in this way. Physics may look like uh, uh, is far away from uh, computer science but there is another place which is called a Fourier transform. Fourier series analysis, Fourier transform etc. where the same kind of idea is used and the functions there will turn out, out to be trigonometric functions with some properties for the dot product but defined along the same lines okay so that also is uh, a set of vectors really so that's the reason why we shouldn't get too hung up on this notion of uh, directions because that might lead you to uh, mathematical intuition that may not be right for linear algebra that might limit your uh, the ways in which you might try to solve a problem rather than enhance it okay but coming back to a uh, normal three-dimensional space and uh, an identity matrix in that uh, three by three matrix space, we can say that the first vector that you see here is a first unit vector and the second one is along this, uh, is a second unit vector and so on. And if I have a general vector, which I write as x, y, z in a column, then as you can see, you can take the first vector multiplied by x, second one multiplied by y, third one multiplied by z, and add them up, take a linear combination, and that becomes an, an interesting way of writing that. And this is actually used in, uh, in classical physics quite a bit. The reason to give you this nomenclature i hat, j hat, and k hat as a unit vectors is because if you look up uh, over the internet to find some solution or some proof or something, you might see such notations, especially if the proof is given by some physicist, and then you might get confused why what these things mean. So that's why I'm going to give you this. Now, what is uh, i dot j, i hat dot j hat? That will be the sum product of the elements. So 1 times 0, 0 times 1, 0 times 0, added up. So that becomes 0. So i dot j, j dot k, k dot i, all those things are just 0. But i dot i is 1 times 1, 0 times 0, 0 times 0. That becomes 1. i dot i is 1. i dot i is the, the square of the norm of i. So the norm of i is the square root of 1, which is 1. So each vector has size 1, and they're all orthogonal or perpendicular if you're thinking about vectors with directions. They are perpendicular to each other, and they are unit length. So they are, later we'll call them orthonormal basis vectors for, for uh, R3. Again, I prefer to use the word orthogonal rather than perpendicular because we defined a different kind of uh, uh, dot product here where perpend perpendicularity makes no sense. These vectors are not perpendicular to each other, but they are still orthogonal. If the dot product here, there, if this happens to be zero, that implies f1 is orthogonal to f2, but not perpendicular to f2. But let's look at uh, unit vectors in R2 now, because it's easier to visualize. I have I2, identity matrix in uh, in 2 by 2, in R2 by 2. So the first one there is the first unit vector. So that, in physics, they might call it I hat in our context we might call it q1 later on q1 so it's the unit vector along the first direction so if the first direction happens to be the x direction then you have that vector running from a zero from the origin to one and you have a second one which is a q2 or j hat that is a zero one suppose you take a general vector y it's got the first element 1.5 second element 0.75 which can be expressed as a linear combination 1.5 times 1 zero so 1.5 in the first element and 0 in the second element plus 0.75 times 0 1 so the first element there is 0 the second element is uh, 0.75 add them up you get uh, y so 1.5 times q1 
0.75 times q2 that linear combination is y or if you want to talk uh, in physics lingo is 1.5 times i hat plus 0.75 times j hat so that is uh, the way you will see unit vectors as part of the linear combinations for any general vector okay so those are that's the definition of unit vectors and the property is that uh, uh, desired desirable properties are that uh, they should have unit length and they should be orthogonal to each other now going back to the world of matrices an upper triangular matrix is a matrix with all elements below the main diagonal zero so all elements below the main diagonal zero again notice that i'm not saying anything about the main diagonal or the elements about above them other than the fact that everything below the diagonal is zero all elements below the diagonal are zero so uh, the notation the symbol that we use for that is a uh, u again uij uij being a representative element if this is upper di upper triangular if uij is equal to zero for all uh, row numbers row indices greater than the column index that means the everything below the main diagonal okay so that's the way it looks like this is the main diagonal and this guy is zero and everything along the main diagonal and and above the main diagonal can be anything including zero so the non-zero values can be anything so in particular a zero matrix is an upper triangular matrix and identity matrix is an upper triangular matrix because everything below the main diagonal is zero there are also a lower triangular matrix which i'm going to define right here okay a matrix with all the elements above the main diagonal zero that is a lower triangular matrix okay so a lower triangular matrix everything above the main diagonal zero and main diagonal and everything below it can be anything all right so a zero matrix is upper triangular lower triangular uh, at the same time and is diagonal to an identity matrix is upper triangular lower triangular and uh, diagonal okay now let me go ahead and define one more thing uh, called the inverse uh, of a matrix and singular matrices a square matrix a, a member of r n by n if you can find some other matrix that multiplies a and gives you identity matrix and that matrix is something that we call the inverse of a so what i'm looking for i have the matrix a i'm looking for something that when multiplied on the right or on the left it gives me i identity matrix if i can find such a matrix i'll call that the inverse of uh, uh, a that's, that's like the definition of uh, a inverse i write it as a to the power minus one but i'll call it i'll read it a inverse so a inverse in the world of matrices has the same significance or uh, or uh, implication as the reciprocal for the, in the world of numbers okay i have a number x multiplying it i have another number a a constant if i write an equation a x equal to b everything being number a and x and b being member of r just just real numbers then in order to get x in order to solve this equation what you will do is just divide both sides by a which is b by a which you can also write as uh, a inverse which is 1 over a times b similarly if i have a matrix equation which i have a a matrix b x a vector and b a vector if i can find another matrix a inverse and I multiply it on the left here i have to specify whether it is on the left or right because matrix multiplication in general is not commutative if i do that that becomes equal to a inverse b i'm just multiplying both sides by a inverse so if i can find a inverse i can do this and i know that this is i i also know that i multiplying anything will give me just that anything so i is like number one so i get x equal to a inverse b that is like solving the the set of equations i found the values of uh, my unknowns that will satisfy my set of equations remember a is just a bunch of numbers b is just a bunch of numbers so that is the solution so it's like multiplying a inverse on the left with the this vector which we'll call constants vector later on some people tend to write it as a dividing b but on the left so you cannot write it as b divided by a because that will be like dividing on the right but some people just for fun i think just write it that way so they can write x is equal to that and some for some applications actually implement this notation so if you define a matrix a and if you define b and write a forward slash b in sage math for instance you will actually get the solution for uh, the set of uh, linear equations that are implied by the matrix a and the constant selector b now what i want to say is that uh, just as in the case of numbers not all numbers have uh, inverses i cannot write a inverse in just one spe special case i cannot write x is equal to this this guy 
I cannot do this if a is something. What's a number when a is equal to zero? This guy just doesn't work. This guy just doesn't work. Okay, because one over zero is not defined. Similarly, there may be matrices for which you cannot find a inverse. Those matrices are called singular. In the case of above, of course, zero matrix is a singular matrix, but it's not just zero matrix. There are other matrices also that cannot be inverted. You cannot find a inverse. So what those matrices are and why they cannot be inverted, all those things will come uh, only in the future, maybe starting next week. That is actually part of the solvability of a set of linear equations. So a has the same role as uh, a number in some broad sense. And a inverse in that case has the same role as a reciprocal, except that for a large, a fairly large number of uh, a's, you cannot actually find the inverse, the reciprocal. And that's of course where this uh, this notation comes from the a to the power minus one, which is like uh, the reciprocal. But it's not really the reciprocal, but it's a different kind of operation. So let's move on to uh, determinants. Determinants. So first of all, it's an entity that is defined only for a square matrix. So if it is not square, right away you can say there's no determinant uh, for that matrix. It's not just not defined. So there are multiple notations for it, the delta and single bar around the matrix. And some people might just write determinant or D T A. So for determinant of A, I prefer this notation, single bar around the matrix, which is why we use double bars for uh, the norm. Okay. So it's a single number. So a matrix, a square matrix has a determinant, which is a number. For real matrices, this will be a real number. It's a real number. It holds a lot of information about the matrix, as much as possible for a single number to hold, given that a matrix has got a lot, large number of numbers. It's got a lot of uh, information about the matrix and its behavior, especially when it comes to solving um, uh, equations of which the matrix is a representation. So it's a function of the elements of uh, the matrix A. So we haven't specified what function is what function it is, but it's, it is a function of the elements of the matrix. Okay? So we can write it like this A, my matrix A is a member of uh, n by n this time because it has to be a square matrix. So A has a size n by n and a representative uh, element is uh, A i i j. In that case, the determinant is a function of A i j. By i j here, again, I mean all of them, not just one of them, every single one of them, every one of the n square numbers a i j. Okay? Now, if you think of uh, the matrix A as a transformation okay, of uh, one vector to another. So let me actually explain this uh, in some more detail because it's one of the first times we are coming across this one. Suppose I have a matrix A is a member of uh, R m by n, which just means that A's got m rows and n columns. Then if I have a set of equations A x equal to b, then x has to be a member of uh, r n because uh, the number of columns of a will have to be the number of rows of uh, x, which is the number of elements of the vector x, so is r n, and b will turn out to be a member of r m, r m. So you can think of a as though as a transformation that takes vectors in r n and gives you vectors in uh, r m. Okay, so you can write A, we use a different color, A as a transformation that takes vectors in Rn and maps them to vectors in Rm. Now, for square matrices, n is equal to m, we call both of them n. So, what you have is uh, A taking vectors in Rn and giving you vectors in Rn. So, in the previous case, in this case, it was a mapping from one space space to another as it were. Here it's uh, one space to maybe a copy of itself or maybe we can e even think of it as a one space to itself. It's not actually taking a vector from one space and giving a vector in a different space. It's taking a vector and transforming it in some fashion. For instance, it might be doubling the vector or it might be rotating the vector or something in the same space. So that's the way we can look at it if it is a square matrix. Okay. Now A inverse in this case a inverse, we wrote A inverse in this fashion, we wrote x bar is equal to A inverse B vector, x vector is a A, a inverse uh, B. This is only for, remember here we are talking about A in R n by n square matrices from now on. We wrote it that way. If we can find such a, uh, an inverse, then it's a mapping from, uh, it's like something that reverses the first operation. First. A, what A did was to A to Q from Rn to Rn, 
A inverse also takes you from Rn to Rn. But in the first case, here what it did was to take x to b. Here what it's going to do is take b and give you back x. So it's like the, the reverse of the operation. It's like, uh, like undoing what a did. So that also jives well with uh, this notion of a inverse and it being reciprocal because multiplying by the reciprocal is kind of nullifying the effect of multiplying by the original number etc. So it all fits in quite nicely. Okay. Now exactly like uh, when the number was 0 you couldn't take the reciprocal. When you don't have uh, the, the inverse you cannot actually invert the, the operation. You cannot find the, you cannot reverse the operation. And that happens when the determinant is equal to 0. When the determinant is equal to 0 then a inverse doesn't exist and then you cannot take uh, the the reciprocal or the inverse. So the determinant, the single number has some role as the the magnitude of the number in a real the real world, uh, the world of real numbers I mean. Okay. So if the determinant is 0 you cannot find a inverse. So that is a that is true. So if determinant is 0 a is called singular matrix is not invertible and you cannot actually solve the set of linear equations. You cannot find a unique set of solutions for the set of linear equations, system of linear equations. So that gives us a, a kind of an algebraic interpretation of the determinant. By algebra, I always mean solving a set of equations. Okay. So the solvability of the set of equations is determined by the determinant of the matrix. If determinant is uh, not equal to zero, then the system has a unique solution. There's only one solution because we can find A inverse. We'd haven't specified how to find it but in principle we can find it. So you can write what I wrote in my whiteboard a minute ago ax equal to b so multiply both sides with uh, a inverse on the left so you get ix equal to a inverse b so x equal to a inverse times b if you can find a inverse. It is kind of like dividing both sides by a but on the left so people started writing it that way to indicate that you're actually dividing on the left and that actually turned out to be a notation that can be used uh, in uh, in certain languages like uh, like sage math certain applications like sage math and matlab and maybe in math mathematica all those things okay so th let me restate it a bit say it once more existence of a non-zero determinant is a necessary and sufficient condition for the uniqueness of solutions the ex existence of non-zero determinant is a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the inverse and by consequence the existence of a unique set of solutions. Okay, so that's what the statement is. So that is like the algebraic interpretation. It says something about the solvability of the system of linear equations that the matrix represents. All right, moving on. In addition to the, the algebraic interpretation related to the solvability, we also have a geometric interpretation for the determinant. All right, in order to explain that to you, let's take a step back and look at uh, the behavior of a matrix, what it does, what it does in terms of transformation. So if I can figure out what it does to the unit vectors, which are columns of, uh, of the identity matrix, and we're talking about uh, two-dimensional case in the, now. If you can talk, if you can figure out what it does to the unit vectors, then any other vector is a linear combination of uh, unit vectors. So you can actually figure out what it does to any vector, which is the basis of linearity, which is why we like linearity so much. Okay, so let's look at uh, what A does. A is a general matrix in which I have uh, elements A, B, C and D and the unit vector, the first unit vector is 1, 0 which is the first column of the identity matrix and if we multiply it's easiest to see this using the column picture of uh, matrix multiplication. What does it say? It says that take the first column, scale it by 1, take the and add to it the second column scaled by 0. So it basically means just take out the first column. So a times 1 0 is actually just the first column of uh, the matrix A. Okay, It's the first column which is A B. Similarly the second unit vector multiplied will just pick out the second column. This is 0 times the first column plus 1 times the second column so which is just C D. Okay? So the blue the blue second vector gives me the blue second column of uh, uh, my matrix A and the red one gives me the red one. So what we can say is that A maps the first unit vector to its first column and the second unit vector to its second column. So that's what A does to the unit vectors and by extension now any other vector is just a linear combination of uh, these unit vectors. So it does exactly what it does to the first unit vector and the second unit vector but after that you just have to take the same linear combination. All right that's that. Now if you think about it 
what it does is to take a shape, a square, which is like the unit vector along the x direction, unit vector along y direction, and the square there, it takes that square and then maps it to something else. So let's see what it does, what it does. So let's start with that. I have my first unit vector, which gets mapped to AB, the first column. I don't know what A is, I don't know what B is, so it's just some random vector. Okay. Similarly, it takes the second unit vector and maps it to some other random vector. So the mapped transformed vectors are in the brighter colors. So the blue unit vector becomes a blue random vector or blue transformed vector with, with a brighter blue, blue shade. Now, what is happening is that if I take, if I look at both the vectors at the same time, you can think of looking at that square there, the unit square that is uh, represented by one edge, one zero, the other edge, zero, one, and the far corner, one, one. This is the sum of those two guys. And that gets transformed to a parallelogram because one side gets transformed to AB, other side gets transformed to CD, and then the corner gets transformed to A plus C, B plus D. So that's the parallelogram. So I can say that uh, the square gets transformed to a parallelogram and what's the area of the square, which is actually the determinant of uh, my identity matrix, which is one. And the area of the parallelogram is actually AD minus BC, and that will turn out to be the determinant of A. Actually, we're gonna define the determinant of A to be that entity. That's what we're gonna do in a second. We're gonna define it. I'm gonna just tell you that that's what it is. But the fact that that entity is actually the area is something interesting, and we can actually visualize it very soon. So let me define the determinant of a matrix in two by two, def determinant of a two by two matrix, I mean, okay. If A is a member of uh, R two by two, then uh, a general one is a uh, A, B, C, D, a general matrix has uh, elements A, B, C, D in the first and second columns. And then the determinant, I'm defining it now. I'm giving you the formula. It's A, D minus B, C. Now, as you can see, depending on the numbers, it can be positive or negative. So, but ignore the sign for now. But the magnitude of that guy is actually the area of the parallelogram where one corner is zero zero the origin the second corner is the first vector the point to which the first vector points another point is the point to which the second vector points and the third one is actually the point to which the sum of the vectors points so this i haven't proven yet but i'm telling you that's what it is and let me prove it to you now this is a very smart proof not mine unfortunately it's actually done by somebody i found it on a on a, a stack overflow and just reproducing it here for you so i have the parallelogram of which the corners are the the what is called the vertices are of zero zero a b c d those are the vectors i'm representing the coordinate i'm using the coordinate representation now not the vector representation okay and the far corner is a a plus c b plus d because that is a sum of a b and c d as vectors okay now that is uh, this is the area i'm looking for of the red uh, uh, parallelogram and now ad the first term in the determinant is actually the area of this uh, blue rectangle here okay one side is a the other side is d so the area is ad and the second rectangle the green rectangle there is a smaller one is actually if you look at the sides from the numbers there its base is c and its height is b again the area then is a uh, base times height is a c b so the difference is going to be turn out to be the 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 determinant is going to turn out to be the area of uh, the blue rectangle minus the area of uh, the green rectangle because the determinant is ad minus bc but i haven't proven it i'm just showing it to you now if you look at uh, what i'm planning to do is this i want to build the red uh, parallelogram by taking pieces from the blue one and chipping away the pieces that are in the the green rectangle so there is one piece here another piece there in the green rectangle and uh, so let me call this two and I have a third piece here the third piece the first one is like a wedge like a triangle the second one is another wedge the third one is like a narrow head or something so let's look at uh, where they go so if I look at the first one that is the same as this little wedge here by the property of parallel lines and all that you can figure that one out okay the second wedge is actually that so if I chip away that wedge and that wedge I'm getting closer to the parallelogram the red parallelogram and if I take that yellow triangle and move it to this side and I got I chipped away that part of the the green rectangle so I'm getting even closer to my parallelogram and that ended up on the right hand side of the parallelogram so I'm filling up the parallelogram okay 
and similarly there is a blue one down there i move it to the top so i get uh, the parallelogram almost perfectly in the bottom except that as you can see the blue one overlap the red the the yellow one so i'm counting that arrowhead region twice so i have to subtract that away so i have to subtract this wedge number one this wedge number two and the arrowhead so that is basically they add up to the little triangle a little the the green rectangle so i have to take the the blue rectangle and subtract away the green rectangle to get the area of the parallelogram so that's my statement there so the determinant is actually ad minus bc which is like the, the area of the the blue rectangle minus the area of the, the the green rectangle and that happens to be the area of the red parallelogram now this is actually a very nice proof and it's called the a proof without words and i used a lot of words to actually explain this to you but if you just stare at it and look at it and try to figure it out by yourself you will get the pleasure of actually having that aha moment whereby it dawns upon you that this is actually true so i i won't explain it again i'll let you look at it and figure it out for yourself so that you get the pleasure i don't i don't uh, deprive you of the pleasure of actually finding it out for yourself and if you do need words uh, rather than just uh, diagrams it is actually linked in my textbook there's a link to the proof with words using the same kind of diagram so you can go and uh, look at the stack overflow and uh, and see it there but it's a nice proof okay? but it is indeed true that the area of the the parallelogram to which the unit uh, uh, unit square transforms is actually the determinant of the matrix that does the transformation now that took care of the the magnitude of the determinant but there is a sign also that we have to worry about what does the sign say so let's uh, call the determinant the signed area of uh, the transformed parallelogram okay so that is in uh, r2 it's an area in r3 that becomes a volume to which a unit cube transforms a unit cube transforms that what does it transform to it transforms to a parallel pipette not not a parallelogram but a three dimensional equivalent of that and if you go to rn if you go to n dimensional space it's again the signed volume of a this is signed hyper volume because it's a multiple dimensions now okay it's a signed hyper volume of a hyper cube so that's how you see this uh, you start with you know two dimensions or three dimensions that we can easily visualize and understand then we extend it to n dimension where the intuition will work even though we cannot visualize it that's the game that we play in linear algebra okay so uh, where does a sign of the determinant come from so that in order to see that i have a couple of more animations what i'm going to say is that uh, if the order in which the transformed vectors appear is the same as the order in which the original unit vectors appear then the sign is positive if the order is flipped for whatever reason then the the sign is negative so let me tell you what that uh, means using my animation so i have my original matrix the first unit vector gets transformed to 2 1 over there the second unit vector the blue one gets transformed to 2 2 the first one gets transformed to the first column the second one to the second column now look at the order by which i mean my blue unit vector in order to get to the blue unit vector from my red uh, unit vector you have to go in the counterclockwise di direction physicists are very fond of uh, this kind of stuff about the handedness so we use a right hand to go from uh, the red unit vector to the blue unit vector using the fingers along the direction of motion then the thumb will point in the direction in which the angular momentum is if it was like a particle spinning in that direction that would be the angular momentum so that's in the positive z direction so that is positive if you look at the the red transform vector in order to go from the red transform vector to the blue transform vector from this guy to this guy again i have to wrap my fingers in the counterclockwise direction and the angular momentum is again in the same direction okay so that is called the area that the sign of the area okay so the area the magnitude is the the, the magnitude of the determinant the sign is the sign of the determinant so in this case the determinant is uh, ad minus bc so 2 times 2 minus 2 times 1 that is 2 it's positive so in this case area is positive okay so the blue vector if you want to use a more common language is to the left of the the red vector both in the unit case unit vector case and also in the transform vector cases so the the sign is uh, positive now the second case what i want to do is to look at a different uh, matrix a now for which the determinant is actually zero so if you look at my first unit vector is 2 1 
and the second unit vector can you see something special about the second unit vector there oh, sorry second vector in a not the unit vector second vector in a second column of a can you see something uh, special about it can you guys see something special it's the scale version it's twice the first column okay actually i have it right here a2 is a uh, two times a1 so what does that mean we already know that uh, they are going to be on top of each other in terms of uh, direction so the second one is on the same line as the first one so the first unit vector gets transformed to the light red one the second unit vector gets transformed to the light uh, blue one they are on top of each other so what happened to my parallelogram it got squished into a line so that the area is actually zero okay area is zero so there's no question of sign now it is just zero okay now the third case it is the same as the first case except that i swapped the first column and the second column which is the same as swapping the first row and the second row which is interesting now what happens to my first unit vector that goes to 2 2 and what happens to my second unit vector it goes to 2 1 but it's on the other side of uh, 2 2 so in order to go from uh, the red unit vector to the blue unit vector uh, my thumb is pointing in the positive z direction in order to go from the red transform vector to the red uh, the blue transform vector if i use my my fingers along that direction that is in clockwise direction and my thumb is pointing in the opposite direction so in one case it was positive c the next case is negative c so that's when we uh, when we uh, uh, ascribe a negative sign to the determinant or rather that's when the determinant has a negative sign okay so the blue unit vector was to the left of a uh, red unit vector but the blue transform vector was to the right of uh, the red transform vector so if you look at the determinant 2 times 1 minus 2 times 2 is minus 2 area is the same the magnitude of the area is the same but the sign is negative so that's the meaning of the sign and when you go to three dimension the same thing applies if a uh, one vector uh, flips uh, direction flips as in uh, it goes to the other side of uh, one of the other two vectors then you get a minus sign okay now is that clear is that okay with uh, you guys are you guys with me okay good now let me go ahead and define uh, the determinant of a three by three matrix we're going to do it recursively meaning we're going to define the, the determinant of a three by three matrix in terms of the determinant of a two by two matrix which we have already defined okay so for a three by three matrix this uh, horrible looking matrix here a11 12 13 etc etc this is the way we're going to define it it is a11 times the determinant of the matrix that is obtained by deleting the first column and the first row so a11 they delete the first row and the first column you get a sub matrix it's a determinant of that sub matrix multiplied by a11 and the second one is a minus sign minus sign a12 and in that case delete that column and that row and the sub matrix that is left over take its determinant and the third one comes to the positive sign so the signs are alternating so a13 so delete that the third column and the top row and take the sub matrix and find its determinant which we know how to do because it's a two by two matrix so that's the recursive formula okay so since we have already defined determinant for a two by two matrix now we have a determinant for a three by three matrix so the negative sign is important okay so what we did was to find the determinant by expanding along the top row here we could have played the same game by expanding along the the first column if you wanted to so you'll take the first element and find the determinant of this guy take the second element and delete that column and the and that row and find the sub matrix etc so you could do it with any column any row except that you have to worry about the the negative and positive we'll see how that is done in a second it actually the question is does it apply to any n by n yes because if it is a four by four you will do the same thing then you'll get a bunch of three by three matrices and then you will do the same thing for each one of the three by three then you'll get a bunch of two by two matrices and then you know how to do it uh, how to expand it so it does work for any n by n matrix okay now the interpretation the geometric interpretation of uh, the determinant in r3 is that it's the signed volume of the parallel pipe to which a unit cube gets transformed by uh, the matrix so that is a it's again the signed volume and if you go to rn it's a signed hyper volume of the hyper parallel pipe to which the hyper cube hyper unit cube or should i say unit hyper cube transforms okay so this is the game you understand what it does in uh, two dimension you understand kind of understand what it does in three dimensions and then you just say that it applies to all dimensions now to make this uh, definition a little bit uh, more manageable i'm going to define two entities two 
new words, new new terms, minors and cofactors, minors and cofactors. So let's look at the three by three matrix and its uh, expansion again. So I have A11 from here that multiplies this uh, red uh, determinant, which is the determinant of the sub matrix obtained by deleting the corresponding row and column. Then I have a negative sign and I have a blue matrix, blue determinant here, which is the determinant of the sub matrix obtained by deleting that column and that row. So A2123, 2123, 3133. Similarly for the last one, which comes with a, with a positive sign. Now the determinant of the sub matrix obtained after deleting the row and column corresponding to the element out here, that is called a minor. It is not the, the matrix itself, it's actually the determinant of the submatrix. It's not the submatrix itself, it's a determinant of the submatrix. Okay, so the minor of A11 is this red guy here. The minor of A12 is a blue guy here. And uh, the minor of A13 is the black guy here. Or I should probably be more careful there, I should say the determinant in black there. All right, now the minor is uh, denoted by M11. So the minor of A11 is M11. It is the red uh, determinant here. Okay. So Mij in general is the determinant of a sub matrix without the ith row and the jth column for any matrix. So A, a member of uh, Rnn, take out the ith row and the jth column and take that determinant. That becomes the minor of Aij. All right. Now the second one has a negative sign. Second one has a negative sign. So take the minor <clears throat> with the associated negative sign, negative or positive signs. That is called the cofactor. <clears throat> so minor with the associated sign is the cofactor, and it is denoted by C I J or C one one, C one two in this case for the second one. So how do you get the sign? Sign is obtained by taking minus one to the power i plus j. So for the first guy, i is 1, j is 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. So the sign of that cofactor is uh, minus 1 to the power 2. So that's positive. Second, 1 and 2. So the sum is uh, 3. So minus 1 to the power 3, I get minus 1. So that's why that's how I get the negative sign here. 1 and 3 here, that is uh, even again. 1 plus 3 is even. So I get a positive sign there. So that's how you get the signs. So cofactor is the minor times minus one to the power i plus j. So that's the definition. So I define minors and cofactors. Remember, these guys are numbers. They are, determ they are determinants, so they are numbers. They're not matrices, they are numbers, okay? That's why they are in, uh, not in bold. They are in uh, normal characters. So using the minors and cofactors, you can actually define the determinant, uh, okay? You can provide a formula, a recursive formula for the determinant, which is like this. So expanding along the ith row, the determinant turns out to be a summation minus i to the power i plus j, the element times the minor, or you can kind of absorb the sign into the cofactor. I can say is a summation one to n of aij times the corresponding cofactor. It works for any column and any row actually. So here the summation was done over j, that means I'm expanding over uh, the ith row, but you can do it for any. Now, this is the formula. There's a mathematical definition of a determinant. And this turns out to be the, the volume. If you actually do the computation of the volume, this turns out to be the volume in, uh, in n dimensions. Maybe you can verify this using sage math or something, find the volume, and then actually find the volume using uh, the determinant. That might be a good exercise. Even though this is like a decent looking formula, compact enough, there's a horrible formula when it comes to actually computing determinant uh, in a computer because it's recursive. Recurs recursion is uh, not a good thing in uh, in computer science for numeric computations. Okay, so this is nonetheless the famous Laplace expansion for the determinant. Computationally, quite bad. So it is also the signed volume, hypervolume of the parallel paper, hyper parallel paper in n dimensions. So let me give you one example to show you how horrible this can get. So four by four matrix there, I want to find its determinant. So what do I do? I take the first element, I'm expanding along the, the top row and delete that row and that column. I get the sub matrix there, find its determinant and multiply that by that element seven. And that comes with a positive sign. The second one, that is a element or one, two, first row, second element. So minus one to the power uh, three, that is minus one. So I get a negative sign. I delete the top row, the second column, I get the blue determinant and so on and so forth. Okay. 
alternating signs. And in order to get this guy, I have to again expand it, get two by two and then expand that. So it's a horrible compu computation. Don't worry, I'll, I'm never gonna ask you to do this by hand in an exam. Now let's go through the properties of our determinants. Okay, so again, the notation I will use is usually this, but at times maybe just delta to say a determinant. So the identity matrix has a uh, determinant equal to one. So if you expand it along the, the top row or the, the first column, you'll see that by the formula, you can see that that's what it is. Also, you can see that it's actually the volume of a unit cube or a area of a unit uh, uh, square. Okay, so that's why it's one. Now, the second thing is if you exchange two rows or two columns, the determinant will change sign. Okay, so let's actually, yeah, let's spend a couple of uh, seconds on this one. So if I have a, a matrix, say 1, 5, 7, 3, 1, 2, 1, 7, 9, something like that. If I go ahead and uh, switch these two guys, two rows, whatever determinant it had, whatever determinant it had will become the negative of that number by switching up. That basically comes because of the cofactor sign and the minus one to the power thingy. So if you look at it carefully, stare at that for some time, you will see that that's what's going to happen. Okay. And of course, if you switch it again, then there will be one more minus sign that will cancel off. What it's saying is that so something kind of interesting. What it is saying is that by having an odd number of uh, uh, switching, you cannot get back to the same matrix because a matrix has a certain determinant the determinant cannot change. So after doing a lot of sw switching, you say that it has, uh, it is the same matrix. What you're saying is that it's got the same determinant, which cannot be true unless the number of uh, flipping is even. If it is odd, then the determinant will have to be negative, so which is kind of interesting. Later next week, we will talk about matrices that actually do this uh, flipping of rows. They are called permutation matrices. What it is saying is that permutation can be only odd or even, okay? It actually, gives you the determinants of all permutation matrices. Since I use the, the term permutation matrices, let me tell you, let me show you what it is. If I have a matrix that is 0, 1, 1, 0, which is like two, the, the rows inverted in a, an identity matrix, that inversion is what it's gonna to do to any other matrix. You can actually convince yourself by multiplying it to a general matrix. And you compute the determinant is 0 times 0 minus 1 times 1 is minus 1. One, in, one swap is minus 1. Similarly, you can do the determinant of these guys in uh, three by three. Those are permutation matrices that swap uh, one row, one pair of rows. And the last one is actually a, a matrix that actually does uh, two swaps and that will have a determinant of one. So it actually, again, all these guys are row swaps of uh, the identity matrix as you can see. Okay? That's how you see what, which rows are getting swapped. Okay, the first row became the second row. First row of identity matrix became the second row here. The second row became the first row here. So that's what it is. We will see more, of, we'll talk, we'll have more to say about permutations in the next class, but this is just a preview. Okay, it's like a teaser. Moving on. If you multiply one row or one column by a number, then the determinant gets multiplied by that number. Okay, this is because determinant behaves like a volume. So let me show that also to you in a couple of uh, ways. So what it does is uh, if in R2, if you double one side of a, of a square, then the area doubles. It's doubling only one side, it's like doubling one row. Suppose you have a matrix A is equal to 2, 0, 0, 2. What that means is that it takes the first unit vector and then maps it to 0, 2. And the second unit vector will go here, okay? So it, the unit square here gets mapped to that one. That's what it did. So the parallelogram is actually a square here. Now suppose I multiply the, the first column of first row by two. So my A2 is equal to, let me use a different color here. My A2 is equal to four zero zero two. So I multiplied only one row or one column. It's the same thing because the other one is zero anyway. So what does this do? It takes the first unit vector and maps it to four zero. So it comes over here and the second unit vector still goes to zero two. So it's there. So that is the new, that's the action of uh, A2. What's its area now? Its area now is uh, four times two, it's eight, okay? So what's the determinant? Four times two, eight, it has to be. So I doubled one column and the determinant doubled. But if I double both of them, which I can use uh, another color, if I double both, let me call it A4, that is a four, zero, 
0, 4, I'm doubling both. Then the first one goes here, so this guy goes here. The second one also goes to 4, so the whole thing goes to this square, where the area is actually 4 times, because determinant behaves like a like an area in this case, or a volume in, uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, R3. In this case, it uh, area doubles. Uh, you double all sides, the area becomes, uh, what, what does the area become? If you double all sides of a square, what does the area become? How many times? Times 4. What about uh, I take a unit cube and double its sides, what does the volume become? 8 times. It becomes 2 cube. And if it is an n-dimensional hypercube, if I double all sides, what does it become? 2 to the power n, not 2n, 2 to the power n, 2 to the power n. Okay? All right. So that's how you extrapolate again from uh, something that we can understand to something that we cannot visualize. Now, this, the fourth one says if you split a row or a column, then the determinant gets split into two. That is a cryptic language. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So if I can write a determinant, suppose I had say five here and uh, two here. Suppose I write this as a three plus two and one plus one. Okay. Then I can actually split the determinant as a sum of two determinants. This again comes from uh, the equation. If you just look at uh, the, the formula that are plus expansion, you will see that this is actually true. Okay. So you can actually ex do this kind of expansion, which might be useful in some proofs. Okay. Another one is if you have one row or one column of zeros, then the determinant is zero. That should be again obvious from the Laplace expansion. You just expand along that row or that column, then everything, every cofactor gets multiplied by zero. So the determinant is zero. Okay. Another one, add a multiple of a row or column to another row, the de determinant doesn't change. This needs a bit of an explanation. Okay. What is happening is this. As you know, a matrix represents a system of linear equations in which each row, each row is actually an equation. Right? It's an equation. So the manipulations that you can do with an equation is to scale an equation by some number and add it to another equation, which is what uh, this guy does. Add a multiple of a row, which is like an equation, to another row and that determinant doesn't actually change. Let me ignore all the columns there and I'll tell you why when we come to the last property. Just say that, just think about rows now, okay? So it is like, it's because it comes from the system of linear equations, that's why we actually look at that kind of operation. Now, if two columns or rows are equal, then the determinant is zero. Why is that? What you do is, uh, it's actually a consequence of five and six. You just scale one of them by minus one and add to the other one. You get a row of zeros and then the determinant is zero. In the case of systems of linear equations, what it is saying is that two of your equations are the same. Then you don't have n equations. You have only n minus one equations and then you cannot really find a unique set of solutions. That's what it is saying in the case of uh, systems of linear equations. Okay. This is another interesting property. If you have a triangular matrix, the determinant is actually just a product of the diagonal elements. Let me actually show this to you by having a lower triangular matrix here. I want to find the determinant of A. I will expand along the top row here. So the first one, A times the, the cofactor, this guy, and the second and third terms just vanish because it's going to get multiplied by zeros. So I don't worry about that. And inside also, I have a zero there. So it's only the first element, uh, first product that is significant. The second one gets multiplied by zero. So I just get A, D, F. So that is very nice. So if you can, <clears throat> get to a triangular matrix from any matrix using operations that do not change the determinant, then this is a, a cool way of uh, finding the determinant because multiplication is simple. But the recursive com computation of a determinant is not simple. It's expensive. So we will actually see this next week. So if it is a lower triangular matrix, you will uh, expand along the, the first row to see that this is true. If it is an upper triangular matrix, you will expand along the, the first column to see that this is true. All right. Are you okay with this? Are you doing okay? I see only one green. Somebody is not doing well. I don't understand. Okay. I see only one green. Somebody... Okay. All right. So um, another thing is that if uh, determinant is zero, then it, the matrix is singular. If it is determinant is not zero, then the matrix is invertible. And this, why this is true, will become more apparent and more obvious when we look at uh, uh, row reduction operations uh, next week. And we'll talk about an entity called pivots, which we haven't even defined yet. Okay. Another property, which is a very important and interesting property, is that determinant of a product is actually the product of determinants. This is not easy to prove as far as I can tell. I couldn't prove it myself and I couldn't even find a proof 
that is uh, something I could share with you. So if you can prove it, uh, share it with me. Or if you can find a proof also, share it with me. Find a proof using concepts up to now rather than something in the future. Okay, then uh, share it with me. But there is an interesting consequence to this. We know that A times A inverse is I. And we know that the determinant of I is 1. So determinant of A times determinant of A inverse is 1. That means A inverse and uh, A, their determinants are reciprocals of each other. Which is again kind of nice because the determinant has some connection with the with a number, right? It's like a number. It behaves like a number associated to is Yeah, because when the determinant is zero, the reciprocal doesn't exist, the inverse doesn't exist, and so on. The last property is that the transpose of a determinant, or rather, the determinant of a transpose is the same as the determinant of the matrix. This is again is easy to see if you look at the, the Laplace expansion formula. Expand along the first row for the for the uh, matrix and first column for the transpose of the matrix and all the terms are identical okay so this is obvious now for this reason whenever i said row or column whatever i said for rows will apply to columns too in all these properties because you know column and row swapping is what uh, transpose is really now i have one exercise that uh, i have nicely done in the textbook and i wanted to go through this but we may not have time this is, but I'll tell you the consequence of it. We saw that the determinant of this guy, or we defined the determinant of this guy, of a two by two matrix like that, AD, AD times BC. We defined it that way. Now, it is possible to derive this using the properties. What that means is that if you start with the properties of determinant, saying that we're looking for a number with these properties associated with the matrix, then we will see that for a two by two matrix, this is the number. So we'll actually end up with this starting with the properties which is a kind of interesting academic mathematical kind of uh, exercise to do. And uh, this is uh, Gilbert Strang in, his, in one of his lectures on determinants. He actually did this. So I saw this and uh, it is interesting from a theoretical mathematical perspective, academic perspective. And uh, the fact that the properties are not merely the consequence of the definition, but they are also the starting point of the of the requirements on the determinant okay so don't look at the slide to understand the the proof look at the textbook it's in a box and it's got many more steps and uh, uh, the reasons are explained there better so transpose is a fairly simple concept just swap the rows and columns which is the same as saying flip define a main diagonal which is a uh, which is a collection of the elements with the same row index and column index and flip about that main diagonal so it's the same thing so basically the main diagon diagonal stays the same in the transpose also then we did the product rule of transposes and uh, we didn't actually prove it here but we looked at it uh, from a couple of different angles and with an example the proof is there in the textbook you can go through that then we talked about the properties of determinant the determinant is actually the signed area or volume or hyper volume of the parallelogram parallel piped or hyper parallel piped to which a unit square, unit cube, or a hyper unit cube transforms to by the action of the matrix A. Okay. Then we said if the determinant is zero, that means A is singular, which means it cannot be inverted, which also means the transformation that A did cannot be reversed, cannot be reversed. Most likely what it means is that multiple vectors get transformed to the same vector. So if I give you the output vector, you don't know where it came from. Okay. Then we talked about the product rule. The determinant of a product is a product of the determinants. We did not prove it, but there is a consequence to it, which is that a matrix and an inverse will have determinants that are reciprocals of each other. Then we defined the determinant of a two by two matrix, AD minus BC. And expanding on that, we actually came up with a, a recursive formula for determinants. We didn't come up with it. And then we started with a rec recursive formula and said that it could be the recursion can be halted because we know the determinant of a two by two matrix. Later on, we said by looking at the properties of the, the determinant, the two by two determinant, the determinant of a two by two matrix is actually a consequence of the properties of the requirements or the number defined on the matrix, defined, defined as a function of the elements of the matrix. Okay. Then a bunch of uh, uh, names of special matrices, square, same number of rows and columns, symmetric, transpose is the same as itself, skew symmetric transposes the negative of uh, itself, diagonal, anything other than the main diagonal zero, triangular, anything other than the main diagonal and uh, below or above zero, 
Then we looked at the very important uh, matrix, identity matrix, and looked at uh, the, what they call the gram matrix, which is A transpose A, which is a square matrix, it's a symmetric matrix, it's got applications in machine learning, and it's also the covariance matrix if the original data matrix has been, uh, has been uh, zero centered. And we defined or we didn't, yeah, we can say we defined the inverse of a matrix and singular matrix when there is no inverse. We looked at uh, the columns of the identity matrix as unit vectors. And we saw that unit vectors, when you transform the unit vectors using a matrix A, the transformation is actually the columns of the matrix A. We saw that using an animation and everything. Okay. Then if I can specify what A does to the full set of unit vectors, that's enough to specify the action, the transformation of A, because any vector in the space is going to be a linear combination of uh, the unit vectors. And by the linearity of uh, matrix transformation, I can say that uh, it's a linear co combination of the transformations of the unit vectors. So which is a nice property, which is actually baked in. We actually constructed the whole machinery of linear algebra until now using that basic idea of a linearity with that intention at the back of our mind. Okay, so that's that. With that summary, do you have any questions for me? Uh, this can be actually proven. The question is, can we explain how adding multiple of a row to another row won't affect the determinant? This is actually prove, can be proven using the properties. And I left that as an exercise in the textbook, I believe. So try to do that on your own using the properties. But the what I said while describing it is that a determinant uh, matrix is actually like the coefficient in a system of linear equations, right? And each row in a matrix is like a linear equation. What can you do with a linear equation without affecting the solutions or the solvability? You can scale an equation and add it to a different equation. It doesn't change the, the solution. So that you can do with a determinant also because determinant has something to say about the solutions of the system of linear equations. So the statement is add a multiple of a row or row to another row not add a multiple of a row to itself. That doesn't work. Okay, so add a multiple of a row to another row. That is, uh, that's the statement. So take a look at, uh, try to prove that using the properties on your own, because that is an exercise question. And uh, if you cannot do it on your own, then sit with a couple of your friends and then try to do it as a group, because that way you learn more. I could show you the proof because I've actually already done it, but I don't want to do it because uh, I think it's more useful for you to actually do these things, play with these things and do it on your own so that you kind of reinforce your, your understanding. You create knowledge on your own, which is uh, apparently a more long-lasting kind of knowledge.